Hi, welcome to Iron Edge's webisode of Securing Your Dinosaur Park, Three Things Your Business Can't Live Without. Um, we are going to be talking a little bit about business continuity and disaster management or disaster recovery, as some folks like to call it. Uh, my name is Andrew Moore. I am the COO of Iron Edge Group. I am being joined today by Dan Mallard. He is our Vice President of Client Experience in Central Texas. Yep. Um, both of us have been doing IT longer than we care to admit. We both think we're younger than we are, um, except for what recently happened as we were talking about putting this webinar or webisode together. Um, Dan and I were talking with the marketing team and we've got a bunch of able-bodied young folks in that group. And it was apparent to us as we quoted things that we thought were funny uh, that the uh, people on our team didn't understand what we were talking about. Right. Yeah, so we started talking about 90s movies <clears throat> and how much we love them and how amazing the 90s were when it came to films Yeah, and uh, kind of what we thought um, a good movie would be to um, kind of break down like the failures of a bad disaster management plan, right? Yeah. So, yeah. You know, fun fact uh, for everybody watching, for the 13 people watching this, uh, Andrew, and, Andrew and I both studied theater in college. Mm. Interesting fact. You that never is, would. That is interesting. Like never would know that. Stuff. That's weird, weird, wild stuff. <laughs> and and we're both sort of movie buffs, especially '90s movies. Yes. And so as we were trying to come up with fun ideas for us to kind of chit chat about for an hour, and movies kind of popped up. We both love movies, and we were trying to kind of rank our favorite '90s movies, and we thought that would be a fun thing, sort of out of the IT realm. And then we kind of tied that back into. Well, what are IT subjects that kind of relate to a 90s movie that then we could rank? And that got too obtuse. And then we settled on this, uh, you know, this topic of <laughs> what in the movie Jurassic Park, what could they have done to better handle the disaster that they faced, especially from an IT perspective? And that's what we settled on today. Yeah, I mean, we could have picked like the Terminator movies and we could have picked like the uh, Matrix or yeah. we could have like there there were some good things that, that happened there. Truman Show, maybe a little bit like that could have there was some technology in there. Absolutely. Maybe we could have just yeah. just why, you know, they didn't have a better disaster management plan. Right, um, right. But what we realized is, is the 90s are legit when it comes to like amazing movies. Like yeah. I personally think the greatest movie ever made despite what you know other film critics might say is goodfellas like it is okay it is hands down probably one of the best movies ever made every time it comes on you have yeah. to watch it right and if you haven't seen it you're doing yourself a disservice yeah that's a terrific movie my favorite is also a 90s movie my favorite movie my number one all time is braveheart terrific movie i love it it's my very also, favorite also a good movie yeah that <clears throat> yeah. was a great flick and um you know, there, it was, you know, the nineties had a lot of interesting facts, right? Like, so, um, the, uh, the movie Shawshank Redemption did mm -hmm. not win, um, best picture that year because of Forrest Gump. They both came out in the same year. Yeah. I, don't know if you I, I can remember a, a college professor telling the class that the, the, one of the reasons Forrest Gump was so good and such a good performance by Tom Hanks was, for him to maintain that character to that level of detail in every different scene of that movie was masterclass in acting. And you don't really consider that you watch a three hour long movie or however long Forrest Gump is, the nuance of his performance for three hours, it's amazing. Well, that's where you look at like, you look at two of the the, pe the people on that, that screen there was Jim Carrey, right? And you go from, you know, uh, what he was doing on In Living Color and then you go into right. the Truman Show, like what they always say, right? And right. it's actually true. Like, you know, drama is easy. Comedy is hard, yeah. right? So if you can be funny, you can be you can be a really good actor or yeah. actress. He's a terrific <laughs> actor. Absolutely terrific. You wouldn't think of it. Truman Show is amazing. Yeah. Well, and then there's a lot of things that like, there was what, what began in the 90s, which people have to start really remembering when it comes to film, is there went from, in the eighties, like practical special effects to the special effects of um, digital. digital, right? Right. Jurassic Park's a good example. Actually, yeah, so it was you, both. It was both. Yeah. yeah. You've got, you've got both, right. But mm -hmm. you've got the matrix, you've got Terminator two, you've got, mm -hmm. you know, Titanic, right. Yes. Um, you know, you, you've got, you've got a significant amount of 
computer generated stuff that's going on right um where it's it's actually really contributing to the plot line and it makes it really interesting for movies that you probably never thought you could have made getting made in this time on top of i think a renaissance in storytelling because it was the independent film movement so you had like mm-hmm. quentin tarantino and right you know kevin smith and a, yeah you know you had uh ben affleck and, and matt damon and others like coming out with just some amazingly well-written like well-directed movies because mm-hmm. you had this renaissance of of storytelling because there was kind of a backlash to some of the big budget stuff right kind of right and then you have movies like jurassic park <laughs> came out around the same time yeah. so yeah. love love 90s movies we could sit here and talk about this all day we could <clears throat> uh i think they're amazing um and I'm sure that some people will argue that like the early eighties were probably more of a golden age of tele or uh, movies. Like, but maybe we'll do one on that. Like back to the future. That would be really, really good. Yeah. Gremlins. Yeah. I don't know. I watched that recently. I don't know if it holds up. It's a slow burn. So that's an interesting thing. I've seen that movie relatively recently, very quickly. My girls both didn't like it. They're teenagers. It's mm-hmm. such a slow burn to where that movie actually starts being an action movie. I mean, it's halfway through the movie. You get you sit there for an hour and let it build and build. And build yeah. And build. So people want that kind of gratification a lot quicker now, or at least it seemed to me when my right. kids watched it. No, I don't disagree with that. Yeah, yeah. I don't disagree with that. So one of the things we're going to talk about today before we get into kind of our, our breakdown of what's going on is that what we felt was missing in Jurassic Park and, and on a lot of businesses is there's the difference between having a plan and having like a program. Right. right. And so um, having a, a program is important because we, we always say that business continuity and security and, and those types of things, they're not a project, they're a program, right? It's not right. a one-time thing that right. you do right. in order to be successful, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, a program is something that lives all the time, you know, and you never stop improving what you have. I, I like this, this graphic that we have on the screen a little bit because it kind of infers something that takes a long time and you constantly massage it and make it better and update it. And you're spending, re- and you just know you're going to have resources dedicated to it forever. That's a program. Um, so th- the, the most successful companies that I've seen, especially in the last couple of years that have dealt with the pandemic, the ice storms, all kinds of crazy stuff that's been happening are people that have programs in place that establish a bunch of uh, policies and infrastructure and they never are content just letting them exist. They're updating them, they're testing them, they're getting new information and it's a living, breathing thing in their environment. Yeah, and the program part is really important too because once it becomes programmatic, it is ingrained in every part of the company. Yeah, that's a good point. So it's like nobody forgets you know, it, it's it's something that's constantly iterated on and becomes a critical part of what a business does, right. not just like, oh, it's flooding today. Oh my God, like, you know, kick the plan in. <laughs> it's, oh, it's flooding today. Like we do this all the time because we practice it and we know it. And then it's just right. part of what we do. Like everybody, you know, let, let's go into disaster management mode. It's part of the culture. Yeah. And that is most successful. We have plenty of other podcasts and discussions on this subject, but it's most successful when you have buy-in from the top down through every employee from the time they start, the HR department onboards them, that this program is introduced to them to when they leave. Yep. It is absolutely true. So, you know, part of part of any good disaster management or, um, or uh, business security program or, you know, whatever it looks like for, from a disaster recovery standpoint uh, really starts with understanding your business and what you do and what your role is and how you function and how you make money. So to that end, uh, what we want to go ahead and, and, and do is uh, get started here with uh, Jurassic Park and, uh, and kind of get to, get to the meat of yeah. what it is we're talking about today, right? So when it comes to Jurassic Park, right, which we're going to talk about kind of like they're, they're, we're going to dissect that we're going to act as two consultants that have come in and they're like, look, we had some problems. <laughs> like, like we need an after action report. Like it got, it got sideways. Like some people got eaten. And for me, like I was saying to, to Dan, when we were talking about this, like you give me an opportunity to watch a movie where people get eaten by dinosaurs and I'm in, I don't I'm care. In. I, I'm in, man. I watched, <laughs> I watched all three of them. Like the third one was terrible. Yeah. Uh, I watched the the world and then the, Sequel to World was was wasn't great. 
Right. Um, I don't know if this next one's going to be good, but I'm also like a Chris Pratt guy. So if like yeah. Chris Pratt's in something, I'll watch it. Yeah. That's doubled up for you. Then you had to watch it. You had I did. to watch it I at did. least well, twice. Yeah. But dinosaurs eating people. That's my jam. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, right it's, it's really good. So, so, <laughs> so, so when we talk about like what's going on with this, we're, so we're coming in as consultants. And so we're like, mm-hmm. all right, um, let's talk about this um, guys. What exactly would you say that you do here? Right. So they're like, well, we, we make dinosaurs, we make dinosaur related products. Um, and, uh, and we, we create an environment by which dinosaurs uh, can hang out and people can come see the dinosaurs. Right. We're like, okay, cool. Yeah. W- w- where did you decide to build your park? <laughs> we built it on an island. So right. from, right. From a disaster management standpoint, that seems like a pretty solid solution, right? Yeah, exactly. The, the dinosaurs couldn't possibly get off the island. Right? Well, never. Dinosaurs yeah. would never be able to fly but, or swim uh, or anything like that. That would be dumb. <laughs> <laughs> they only walk. Yeah. Things, things that evolve can absolutely swim. Right. And they can fly and can do all these different things, but yeah, you're right. So the, the, the actual structural physicality, the physical spot that this, this place is at is on an Island, which at face value seems like a good idea. Maybe it'll, you know, keep the dinosaurs on it, but the bad part of that is what Mr. Moore. Well, so what kind of, and this is a lot of businesses have to think about this, what kind of potential natural disasters or issues could befall you on an Island? What is it? Tsunamis? Is it, is it um, hurricanes, tropical volcanoes? Who knows? Volcanoes. Yeah. It it just so happens this, this particular park has volcanic activity on it, which you find out in later movies. Yeah. You thought this was, well, maybe that they were on a different Island. Maybe that, no, no, it was on this Island. Isla Nublar or whatever it is. Right. So, so you have to know from a business standpoint, like for, for companies in Houston, street flooding is like a thing. Yep. Right. You got to know that. And you got to know, like, maybe you don't put your technology infrastructure in a basement here in Houston. Like that would right. be a terrible decision. Right. right. Like maybe if you've got your infrastructure somewhere in like the Midwest, maybe you want to have it in like, maybe you want to have it in a bunker there underground because mm-hmm. of tornadoes. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll, I'll say something quickly on that. So I worked in the Midwest. I was in an IT department for I don't know, five years or so in the Midwest. And it was a really unique environment because tornadoes were an actual thing that would happen occasionally, which was terrible. And you sort of had to plan for that in your VCR and DR planning, but also were floods and ice storms and snowstorms and extreme heat and all these different things that are just uh, the certain environments are, are, are prone to lots of different disasters or issues that could befall them. So your plan has to take all that into account. Yep. Absolutely. No, the one good thing that Jurassic Park does have going for it is that it really isn't like part of any major supply chain, unlike some of the things we've seen, like with the Colonial Pipeline or the JBS um, uh, food distribution uh, systems that, you know, supply energy or food to large portions of a country or, you know, military infrastructure or whatever. So from that standpoint, like Jurassic Park doesn't really have to worry about anything, right? They they're independently funded by a super rich dude right. uh, who's just like loves the idea of, you know, making people happy and having dinosaurs around. He's not really thinking about, you know, the ramifications of his actions. And yeah. so you've got all that. And then, you know, right. you've got dinosaurs that yes. people can, yes. can go look at. Um, and so when we look at the park from that perspective, <clears throat> you don't really have to worry as a business about kind of what's going on as far as like, you know, your vendors or your partners or whatever. Um, You know, they're a pretty insulated organization there. Right. 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 Seems like they were an insulated organization as we're talking about that type of thing. I think inherently we're going to get to the part, maybe we're going to talk about this next, but we were going to talk about what, what infrastructure and what safeguards do you have to have in place to have a functioning dinosaur park, right? Yep. So maybe that's, nah, that's it. Ah, yeah, there, there we go. go. Right. So, and then, you know, and, and just to kind of like remind everybody, like Jurassic Park was a book. Mm-hmm. We are not talking about the book. The book yeah. was, the movie was excellent, but the book was better. It all, it always is. Um, so the have book. You read was, the book. I did. I've read, I've read the book twice. Okay. Excellent. It is much different. Much different people get eaten in the book than they do. Really? In the movie. Oh, yeah. That. It's good. 
Huh. I'm, I'm one of the plebs that just hasn't read the book. And so I can't it's, be like, ah, oh, the book was better. Yeah. Well, and that's why, that's why the second that. movie was actually not terrible because there okay. was, there was like things that happened in the second movie that happened in the book. They just okay. couldn't get to all of it. There's like a river ride and there's like all sorts of stuff. There's like the pterodactyl paddock. There's like all sorts of things yeah, yeah, yeah. that they have in the book that would have been too much for your heart. If they put it all in the movie, <laughs> would have been too action packed. So having a plan, right? So this is the, the, the thing. So in the movie, right? First and foremost, right? There doesn't really seem to be a plan, right? So if we're going to come in and be like, okay, so we heard people got eaten. Right. Like, what was your plan? Like in the event that something happened. So their first, the first thing they're going to say is, well, our park was designed to work with minimal number of, of employees, right? It's mm -hmm. almost wholly automated, right? And so you begin to see the breakdown of the wholly automated component of Jurassic Park when they're going through the little DNA ride at the beginning and, you know, DNA guys are like, hey, I'm DNA. And then they're like, well, this is great. I want to see the dinosaurs. And they literally like, there's nobody there to secure the ride. And they just open the ride up and they walk out and they walk directly into the secure dinosaur making facility. And like, nobody cares. They're like, there's nobody to stop them. Right? So you immediately begin to see that like, maybe you've got a problem with like how you've secured your, your freaking dinosaur park. I, I think it's interesting that some of the decisions that they apparently made in the movie seem at face value to be good logistical decisions like an island well, that may be a good decision not having random people walking around and doing stuff therefore potentially yeah, a mostly eaten. automated park you have like, to minimize the amount of people right. that can get eaten by dinosaurs correct you would think that's a great idea oh, until right. the automation is affected right and everything goes haywire but we'll get to that yeah. So like you, you, you can see that they didn't really consider some of this stuff. Right. Right. And, and one of the things that happened too, is it doesn't seem like there was a lot of senior level communication going on with the dinosaur park because like all of the sudden, like the guy that runs the park decides he's going to bring in a lot of like scientists to vet like <laughs> what is going on in the park. Yeah. And like, nobody knew they were coming. Oh, and right. nobody checked the weather. And there's this right. massive, like right. tsunami, Storm. not tsunami, yeah. uh, uh, hurricane, hurricane coming in yeah. on them. Right. So you got this huge rainstorm coming, which causes a bunch of people in the park to be like, we got to go. Mm -hmm. I, I guess that was their plan. They were like, well, this, there's this it's big, big, big <laughs> bunch of rain coming. Like, uh, this will be fine. We're right. just going to leave. Yeah. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong with yeah. automation? This yeah. should be fine. The <laughs> owner of the park is here. Right. And he's obviously got a handle on this and he's invited a bunch of outside scientists. So if something goes sideways, like we're good. Yeah. Yeah, that and was what's interesting is Jeff Goldblum's character throughout the movies, basically like, yo, there, there's some major problems here. I mean, he's basically saying, you know, you guys are trying to harness things that should not be harnessed. And he's kind of raising the red flag and he's mm -hmm. just on a tour. He's yeah. only been there once. You know? Yeah. So, so what you have to understand is, and we talk about this in technology all the time, right? Like there have to be controls. Right. There have to be controls in place when you're dealing with technology. So if you have like a ride, so to speak, and then, you know, you, you open the, the, the security guard and you're able to get off of the ride, like there should be a dude there going, Hey, you need to get back in your seat. <laughs> like just maybe. Right. And I right. think that a lot of people need to consider that when it comes to their IT, right? Like if you've got something that's going on, that's a critical part of your business, do not rely on the technology solely as part of your disaster management plan. You need to have somebody checking that, like trust but verifies what they say, yeah. right? Like, yeah. did that thing turn on? Are we accessing things the proper way? Like, you don't want to overmanage it, but there should be somebody responsible for like making sure that the controls, the, the technological controls you have in place are actually implemented in the event of a disaster. Somebody's at least like going, yeah, I don't think that's working. Yeah, I, I think that a, a key thing that I'm hearing you talk about is you can have these terrific plans and you can put this technology in place for a disaster, for a dinosaur escaping, for whatever. Mm -hmm. But if you haven't gone through and had a different part of your company or a third party or a different you know, person that wasn't responsible for putting this thing in, test it consistently mm -hmm. and document those tests, then, then you have a problem, right? You're just assuming this thing is going to work. You're going to assume the dinosaur park will hold together in the middle of a hurricane. Right. right. Well, and we talk about that with, with backups a lot, right? Like yes. backups don't exist unless they unless you can restore them. Right. Otherwise they, it's just 
a yeah. job that runs, right? And if you can't restore the data, it doesn't do any good. So test restores are right. a critical part of a business continuity plan because, Absolutely. or in a disaster management plan, because you want to make sure that you're testing that. again, back to the programmatic approach. Right. So yeah. had, had these folks like had like, I don't know, like hurricane preparedness drills where they were running stuff. Right. And, uh, and, you know, we're tabletopping the eventuality that something bad could happen. Like they may not know. So now we're going to get to personnel mm -hmm. management, which I think is probably one of the most important parts of what's going on here. So we've had a conversation with the folks right over at the Jurassic park, uh, franchise where, you know, they've been like, okay, so this is what happened. Dinosaurs ate some people and they messed up some cars and right. And they got loose and it's terrible for all of us, but you know, they, they've got lysine deficiencies so they're just going to die it'll be fine right and they can't right. reproduce no can't reproduce right. which again i come back to this man like that's jacked like <laughs> like some random some random scientist dude just is like walking around the park and like finds eggs yeah like they didn't have some people like walking around checking that like to make no. sure that the we're dinosaurs weren't up. like getting like busy and like it, making other dinosaurs like randomly. Yeah. It goes with the theme that I guess for their, for their opinion on the safety of, of the park and the people involved, they staffed low. And that's interesting. I want to talk about it very quickly. Uh, you know, at face value, you look at the design of the park on an Island, low staff, that seems like a good idea, maybe to the ownership and the initial people around him. But if you haven't had a, a third party or anybody else come in and, and beat these things up and try to tabletop them, which we'll talk about plenty of times and talk about in a lot of these things. If you're not tabletopping and trying to beat poke holes in your own ideas and your own security, then uh, your view on it can be very limited for sure. And you know, it's a really good point that you bring that up, right? That's exactly what, so the owner of the park like brought in these scientists right. not to be an audit and control group but he brought them in to basically rubber stamp that it was a good idea to make dinosaurs. Right. And to invest too. If I remember right, they were going to, somebody in that group was going to invest. Well, it, well, there were, yeah, there was, a, that was a whole different group where okay. they, it was like the, his lawyer and some people, which was kind of an mm. amalgamation of characters from the book, but okay. like the scientist, like if you bring in an IT group or you bring in an outside set of consultants, like, you know, we're doing for Jurassic Park right now. Right. Um, if you were to bring us in, like, don't discount what the experts tell you. Right. If they're like, you shouldn't make dinosaurs and your whole business is built around making dinosaurs, maybe you've picked a bad like business to invest <laughs> in. Like, or you know, you, you should look at those things. So somebody comes in and be like, most people spend money on cleaning up this part of your infrastructure, or most people spend money on having somebody like you know, managing this part of a disaster management plan. And if they're giving you that advice, like it's probably a good idea to at least consider it and not dismiss right. it. Right. 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 Or, Absolutely. Or let them get eaten. Yeah. Potentially. Yeah, exactly. Is when our company gets pulled into engagements like this and we do plenty of security mm -hmm. engagements and consultative stuff. Um, we generally produce a deliverable and says, here's, here's what we found. Here's, here's basically the lay of the land. Here's all the stuff that we would propose to either secure it, make it better, give you a, you know, forward thinking plan for the next five years, whatever. And we hand that off and we move on about our lives. And sometimes we come in and do the work. And sometimes most of the time we do every once in a while we don't. But once you, once you have that deliverable from us or your Jurassic Park and we've come in and given it to you, there's real value to understanding that maybe you can't implement everything right away, or maybe you have to do it in parts over right. five years, but that's what we ask people to do is like, really consider this, consider what we've talked about. And then, you know, if you need to budget this thing out for five years, absolutely do that. Yeah. that. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. It's, it's better to have the plan and work through it than to just be like, oh man, like we, like they may know about how to make dinosaurs. Right. But they obviously didn't know about like, you know, uh, like chaos math. <laughs> so I mean, yeah. nature finds a way. Right. Nature finds um, a way. So we come back to like personnel management. Right. So one of the things that is a glaring hole to us when they look at Jurassic park is that they did a couple of terrible things. They built an automated park. Right. Right. And they went with the lowest bidder possible, I'm guessing, where they have one IT dude. That's his <laughs> only job. Is the only IT yeah. dude for the entire park, yep. right? Um, except Samuel Jackson doesn't seem like he wasn't an IT guy. He just kind of knew stuff about computers. He, everybody has that person in their company. It's like yeah. they're like maybe their office manager or like, like there's a dude who's like on the engineering team or something right. who's like, he's like Sam Jackson where he's like, 
hold on to your butts. Hold on to your butts. <laughs> right? He's like, I'm going to reboot the server because the IT guy is not here today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, you've got one IT guy that you've underpaid that you don't have any documentation about what he's done. You have no password control. You have no oversight. And your entire company is, is built on the protocols, safety, and systems that this one jackass put in place. <laughs> and you've enabled him by underpaying him and not giving him any support. Right. That's what happened in Jurassic Park. It is, that's, that's the core. Actually, that's arguably the most, uh, the biggest problem in the whole situation is their IT was managed by one dude. One dude and One nobody dude. checked his code. Nobody saw that he had like overrides built into it. Right. And because he felt like he was underpaid for the amount of work that he did for Jurassic Park, right? He decided that he was going to work for their competitor and he was going to steal the dinosaur embryos and stick them in a shaving cream can. And then he was going to turn off the computer systems temporarily so that he could like sneak away, right? But he didn't anticipate a big storm coming. So I guess he was really good at computers, but not meteorology and so he he can't sneak away and then he gets eaten by some dinosaurs and never gets a chance to turn on the systems again and because of that all of a sudden like dinosaurs escaped right so so what i'm hearing is pay your it guy more is that right <laughs> also also fair uh, ryan are you listening no, I'm um uh, you know there's several things just just around that subject that could and if this is you and this is your business, you've got one IT guy and you start to recognize things in our discussion today, you're like, wow, there's, there's some risk here. Well, there's things you can put in place to sort of offset that risk. And not that we're here to solve all the problems today, but by having a, a, you know, a second person in your IT department, by documenting policies and procedures, by having a password management platform, by having network diagrams, by having all of these things in place and constantly working at them and upgrading them, you minimize the risk uh, and, and which is what exactly happened to Jurassic Park. So that's what we suggest to our clients when we go into an environment and they have like a guy. Mm -hmm. Well, how do? We, what if the guy gets? What if he wins the lottery? Yeah. And he's out, and because we all would be. Well, he's gone. He's in Tahiti, living it up. How do you run your system? What if your server goes down? What if every Saturday night at three a.m. it does a job and it doesn't do the job and no one knows what it does, how it does it, when it does it? Right. And, and it's critical because I think that that you know what 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 can happen too and what we deal with is sometimes folks will be like well we've we've got a person but they're overwhelmed we call them the one man band right yep, so yep. they're just doing too much work and they can't be strategic sometimes they're not malicious like nedry was right they're just right. overwhelmed they've got too much to do at any given time there's too many problems with the dinosaur park right and they're just constantly running around and they need mm -hmm. help you don't have to hire another person that can be like the blind leading the blind sometimes right like right. they may be great technicians but they may not be good managers and most people don't want to manage IT personnel. Trust me. Like they are, uh, they're highly intelligent, highly motivated, but they remind me of the velociraptors. They're also very cunning and um, mm. they, they work in packs. <laughs> so, so like they're, they're, they're not for everybody. Right. And so you can work with a managed services firm, right. That like ours, where you can bring them in and they will help to offset that risk by helping right. to document the systems, working with your on-site person. They, we call it co-managed IT, but there are options around that. But those are things that you should be considering as a business owner because they're right. going to document your passwords. They're going to document your network and your processes. They're going to identify gaps. They're going to work with you to fix them, right? I and, think uh, if, focus sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. yeah, sorry to interrupt you. So I think that the thing at Jurassic Park, and this is so silly and it sounds so sales, salesy, but it's true. If it had a co-managed IT solution, with a managed service provider. So the guy say, he, ah, I'm out. And he, and he locks all the computer systems or whatever, he disables them and he walks out with the dinosaur eggs. Well, if you had your co-managed IT solution and your managed service provider, pick up the phone, give him a call. Hey, our IT guy just split. He locked us out. I need you guys to get in. You have documented passwords. You need to get everything back online. Somebody like us, we have the password, mm -hmm. get everything back online. We look at our procedures. We know how to fire everything back up and we're good to go. So. Well, and you could even go as far as to say that, like, even if you don't have a managed IT provider, like just making sure that your documents are like, I hear this all the time. Like that person's got all the keys to the kingdom. Like we're afraid yeah. to do anything around him. And that's kind of what happened in Jurassic Park. They were afraid to tell that dude boo because he was like, well, I could just turn all this stuff off and the dinosaurs would eat everybody. And they kind of knew it, but they didn't, they, they, they didn't really do anything about it. Right. Right. Which is kind of, which is kind of messed up. And so yeah. one of the things you have to really look at too, um, past the personnel is 
like your work centers, right? Like where does the work get done, right? And how do you secure those work centers, right? So in this instance, right, we've got, you know, our, our good friend Samuel Jackson, and mm-hmm. he's mad because Nedry's locked him out of the systems, right? But it's beyond just the, like the technology security that you're dealing with. Like securing your work centers could be, you know, your warehouse space. It could be um, your computer environment. It could be your dinosaur paddock, right? Like making sure that like you have taken the time to build processes and systems that are resilient enough to, um, to continue to function at a minimum amount of, of, um, availability so that you can get your job done, right? Whether that work center is a security-based work center, like dinosaur fences, or if the park's up and running, like it's the point of sale system. So people can buy really cool Jurassic Park merchandise, like books, right? Or little like dinosaurs, like you could buy at the gift shop there, right? Like you want to make sure that those things are up and running because that's how you make money. Um, but you need to focus on making sure that those systems are secured and that you understand what it would take to run those in the event of a disaster at minimum, right? Mm -hmm. And focusing on those work centers. And sometimes uh, organizations need to understand that some of their work centers in a a disaster could be shut down, right? Right? Should be shut down. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll say that using the Jurassic Park example, So as consultants, we go in and we look at it and we go, well, what are the work centers that absolutely need to run to, at the bare minimum, well, your security systems that keep the dinosaurs at bay and then the related IT systems that make those things work. I think that's the minimum that you have to do, uh, you know, and then systems to keep people on the island, you know, fed and, and, you know, safe and things like that. So those are your systems, everything else, the gift shop, the restaurant, all that stuff that doesn't necessarily have to run and may not need your focus. And that's important to know because every department that I've ever talked to, every representative is like, yeah, my department is the most important department of the company. And we need to, we need 24 hour system uptime. Right. And that may not be the case, but in this example, you know, obviously the security and IT systems need that 24 hour uptime in the gift shop. Maybe not. Exactly. Exactly. So, and then once you identify what work centers you need to secure and you've got the right personnel in place and the redundancy to do that, then the next step really is to focus on your investments, right? What you need to invest in in order to b- build that sort of redundancies and to create the a disaster management plan that you want. Now, remember, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about is obviously like it has a price tag. It's an investment in the organization, So when you invest in the technology that you're looking for in order to create these redundancies, you need to figure out like, what is worst case scenario? What is best case scenario? What can your business afford? Right. Right. And then you have to manage to that. Right. So in this instance, right, like they managed to, I'm guessing probably somewhere in like the middle ground, right. Which is, yeah, we've got like some gates, Right. And we've got like some, you know, electrical wire. Right. But they never really thought like they didn't really play chess. They're like, what happens if the dinosaur gets out? Mm -hmm. Like what happens? Like, should the cars that, that we have here be, I don't know, like have like a separate like power supply so that they can move in the event that like a dinosaur escapes or are they just stuck on a track? Right. Or maybe they should have like extra reinforcement so that if he tries to eat them, um, you know, they, they, they may not get eaten or, or maybe they should have done a better job investing in some training solutions for the people riding in the car. So you didn't have to have a genius level scientist say they, they, they operate based on site. Maybe we should stand really still. Maybe it should be a thing. that's like, before you get in here, in the event that a dinosaur does escape, like don't move dinosaurs. Like they use their site to find you. They can't smell you. Like, right those are the things that we would make a recommendation to address the park. Like you should have secondary power systems. You should maybe build some moats, right? Like you should have better technological solutions, right? Maybe you should have like little things built into the dinosaur so that maybe like if they escape, like it'll inject like some like sleepy medicine in them and then they'll go to bed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. For a little bit. Like I there should be something. There should be. And what, what I see is when we go out and talk to clients and potential clients about these type of things, the more secure 
and the quicker uptime that somebody requires in their in their organization is directly proportionate to the amount of money they're going to have to spend. For example, oh yeah. So a client, we go and talk to client. Client says, yeah, our operations have to run twenty four seven, right? They can't be down at all. We say that's terrific. We're here to help. Here's what it takes to make a resilient environment that's guaranteed twenty twenty four seven. And oftentimes we were like, eh, you know, we could be down a day or two. You know, and so just understand that as you under that as you determine what requirements your business needs to run and the time period that it can be down, if at all, you know that's that the the budget is going to dictate some of those decisions as well. So those are interesting discussions as we work with those uh, through our client base. Yeah, and and what what I think is 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 important is that clients understand that some of this is peace of mind, mm-hmm. but sometimes it actually is like a disaster and everybody's like, man, I'm glad we did that. Right. Right. Oh, wow. That was great. Right. Like sometimes there's the perfect storm and something terrible happens and your IT guy's not available and you get ransomware or something terrible. Like, Oh, we've got great backups. I'm glad we spent money on that. Right. It's, it's one of those things where it's like insurance in a lot of ways. And, And it's an investment in, the development of the organization over time to build resiliency. And honestly, the companies that can float themselves through a disaster or even be agile enough to take advantage of the fact that they're still up and running during a disaster in order to gain market share or to service their competitors, clients, that sort of thing, you actually can wind up turning that into a, a, a moneymaker. Absolutely. Right? You can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, 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 sorry. Yeah, yeah the, the opposite is true too, where you don't invest in those type of things. It can absolutely put you out of business. And we've seen that, Andrew. Yeah, that's yeah. unfortunate. And it's it's crazy because like we talk about it and I feel like everybody's like, oh, you guys are just like, <laughs> it's like those farmers commercials where they have like the, the disaster hall of fame and they go in there and they're like, <laughs> been there, done that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like yeah. the, you know, like the goat that like keeps ramming the, the car like that. <laughs> I, yeah, it sounds crazy, but it happens. Yeah. And I don't want to sound like we're trying to scare people, but it it's a thing, right? Like I literally, you know, I had a client that during Ike, like they were, they were a restaurant, their building burned down. Like it burned to the ground, right. right? And their server was inside and it was melted and it was a thing. Like it was a huge problem, right? And so it was like, how do we, how do you survive that? Right? How do you, how do you move forward from that as a business? You know, um, we had a, a potential client that we had been working with um, that got ransomware on their systems and had everything encrypted and they didn't have good backups, you know, part of their disaster management plan. And they were out of business about three months later because they were a manufacturing organization right. and it encrypted their ability to all the databases for their CNC machines and stuff. Yeah. I, when I'm talking to clients, I was talking to one yesterday. I was meeting with a client and I said, our, our, our goal as your, trust, as your trusted consultant and IT provider is to see that the light coming down the tracks, you know, we see the trains and we know how far away these trains are coming at you and the likelihood these things are going to come at you. And as good consultants and as good peers to you, we're going to, we're going to explain those things and we're going to explain the risks to you. And hopefully if we're doing a good job, we can, we can explain the risk and we can explain the benefit versus the cost and put you in a good position to avoid hopefully everything that would happen to you. But, you know, that, that's our role. That's what I see my role in the company and our role as a company, one of our primary roles. Yep. No, I, I agree with that. So, I mean, we, we kind of, you know, as, as the, as the after action report guys for Jurassic Park, like we would come in and be like, well, it's obvious to us that you were underpaying your IT staff, right. that you guys were not in a position to build redundancy there. You hadn't really considered like, additional measures within the park to keep people safe. You had too few personnel everywhere with no controls in place and nobody was constantly trained on what happens in the middle of the disaster because it was just kind of like, huh. And you created like some kind of like weird Rube Goldberg on how to like turn the systems back on. I was like, well, if we turn like, that's the best part. They're like, let's turn. (laughs) They were like lately rebooted. That's how they fixed the problem. They're like, <laughs> we got locked out of the system. So we're just going to turn off the park and turn it back on, which is dumb. So <laughs> let me tell you in real life, like if somebody hacks your systems and you turn it off and turn it back on, like it's still hacked. 
Like, yeah, it's, you may be in a worse spot than you were before you did that. Which. No, it's actually true, <laughs> which they were because yeah. up to that point in the movie, the velociraptors were still in containment. Right. So when they turned the systems off to reboot, the velociraptors got loose and ate more people, which was <laughs> fantastic for me because I was like, yeah, get it. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. is that that dude's arm? Because that's all that's there. That's tight. If you design your system about around like everything failing when it's rebooted, you've got a major problem. That's something else we would propose in our, you know, in our, we would have, uh, we would create a document that, that details all the things we've talked today. And then we would talk about ways to uh, offset those or ways to resolve all of those things. And we would have sections in it that said, okay, you have to, you, you, if you literally can't turn your system off, here's what we would have to do, you know, or, you know, if you only have one layer of fencing, we would put in two, and here's the reason. And there would be a bunch of actionable stuff after that to, to attend to those things. And we would recommend that you spend time on a regular basis going through it and testing your plan yes. and making sure that it works and just being prepared for the worst. Because when you look at what you do as a business, right, we talk about this a lot here at Iron Edge Group, like we're not curing cancer, right? We are responsible for networks for small business owners, and we take that very, very seriously. Some organizations don't have the kind of risk that we have or have a different kind of risk, like as a dinosaur park, like your risk is really high that if a dinosaur got out, it could eat somebody. Like that's a terrible situation from a lawsuit perspective, from a loss of life perspective, and from a lost goodwill perspective with the public because nobody wants to go to a dinosaur park where people get eaten, right. right? They've made a couple of movies about how the park's really cool until people get eaten, right? right? And then you, you can't recover from that. So as a business, <laughs> when whatever your metaphor is for my dinosaurs have escaped, like you need to think about that. And what's the worst case scenario if your dinosaurs escape? Like, is it eating somebody, right? Or is it somewhere a little less than that? And then that's how you start planning like how much it is worth to you as an organization to spend money on a business continuity plan and disaster management plan and the technologies that go with it. Because, you know, it's all about the risk and it's all about spending the money in the right way to help avoid that risk. So, agree. Uh, yeah. Anything else, Dan? Anything we forgot? No, I'm really interested maybe in some more of these, you know, yep. some kind of uh, gremlins might be a really good example somehow. It might, uh, it might, yeah. we might have to do, we might have to do some more, some more breakdown on what we could have done better uh, had we had uh, the type of really good technology management solutions that we do now. So good stuff. Well, we thank you for joining us for our web uh, episode or web episode. And uh, we, we hope you enjoyed our, our uh, fresh take on a classic film that, by the way, has grossed a billion dollars, which is amazing to me. But uh, appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Bye. See y'all. Bye.